just like to say that I strongly believe in the, in the Yeras protocol. That's not kind of surprising, but it's not just because I started to work at an Yeras institution seven years ago. It's also because I've seen the opposite of Yeras care. For example, in the Swedish hospital uh, more than 10 years ago, skilled surgeons really but no perioperative protocol whatsoever. The doctors were their own bosses improvising the protocol. And huge amount of morbidity and length of stay close to three weeks. This is another example of, of uh, this is an example of serious anti-ERAS care when I was in, in Uganda 10 years ago. The same here, skilled surgeons, as good as in many centers in, in Europe, I'm sure but a catas catastrophe in perioperative care. Uh, heavily malnourished patients, loaded with fluids paid by the Swedish government, and a lot of morbidity and length of stay as short as one month. Then when I first read the studies from, from, uh, from Denmark, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, two days of length of stay after colonic surgery. It can't be true, no way. Uh, I just couldn't believe that a tiny little perioperative item could, could have such an impact on length of stay after surgery. But then other studies came, confirming the results from Denmark. And uh, now you have to be a fool if you, don't, if you don't ask yourself why. why how come uh, fast track care is so much better than, than traditional care? Uh, and that turned out to be quite a tricky question. Uh, and I think it is, it is still a tricky question, but it's a really important question in order to spread the word of ERAS and, and improve the protocol. Is it the use of single evidence-based items that matters? And which of them are most important? Is it the full protocol that matters? Or is it just an, an effect of known observation? And the fact is, we don't really know. Here are all the ERAS items, or, or I should correct myself, here are probably all the, ERAS, all, all the ERAS items, because there are so many, you can't even remember them. And you can imagine that some clinics having difficulties with the implementation of all the items. And doctors avoid items. I think that many centers that claim they are running the full protocol are using modified versions. And there are also alternative programs published in the literature. For example, the rapid pro protocol with four items only. But I, on the same time, I don't think you could blame uh, the centers for not running the full protocol, because here there are rooms for some self-criticism among us that believe in running the full protocol because there are problems with error studies. And I think the, the, two, the two big problems are, are one, the numbers of item used because they vary in different studies. Some studies have three items, other, others have 23 items and it's quite confusing. If you're not used to errors, it's quite confusing. And I think it's confusing for us that, that runs it us too. And the other problem is that uh, compliance is seldom reported. And in fact, few items and uh, uh, low compliance, that is traditional care. Uh, let's have a quick look at the, the um, evidence in favor for the ERAS protocol, the recent evidence, the very best evidence we have. To, well-conducted systemic reports. One from the Cochrane coll collaboration in 2011 and one in clinical nutrition in 2010. And here are all the best RCTs we have. Uh, and if we look at the, the uh, overall outcome, there is no difference in mortality and readmissions. There are uh, a reduction in, in uh, morbidity close to 50% and a reduction in length of stay in three days in favor for the EURAS protocol. But looking closer on these studies, you can see that the first uh, systemic review, uh, the studies uses in median 10 items. And 10 items, that's not even half 
of the items that the ERA Society has described. And when it comes to the other systemic review, uh, one of the studies from Delaney only, only includes four items. And four items is not even one fourth of the study of the items described by the ERA Society. And there's also one more problem. Only one of these studies are measuring compliance. So we actually don't know if the patients had an ERAS treatment. Now, I think in, in future research, it's important to define the number and identify the items needed for optimal outcome. And in order to do that, I think it's, it's important to explore the evidence base for each item outside and within the ERAS program. And to do that, you need to analyze impact of compliance of different items. Now, for you who wonder what the ERA Society are doing, I know what they are doing. I have the answer, because I know that they have been looking at the evidence for single items in and, uh, within and outside the protocol. And I will show you a slide about the results. Now, before we go into the slide, you have to be aware of that in order to fulfill, uh, in order to fu for an item to fulfill the criteria according to the great system, to be a high level evidence items, you need several good randomized studies. And that is data that is almost impossible to achieve in some of the items, simply because it's so, it's so difficult to conduct the studies. Now, if you look at the x-axis, you see it the left preoperative items and to the right intra and postoperative items. And in the y-axis uh, you have very low evidence, <laughs> low evidence, moderate e evidence and high evidence. And if you look at the high level evidence row, you can see we have eight items, no bowel prep, no sedatives, thr thrombosis prophylaxis, antibiotics, no gastric <laughs> intubation, active warming, cold directed fluid and so on. But this is a dynamic process. process. For example, we heard a lot today about goal-directed fluids. So we, we might have to push that one down later on next week. I mean, it's a continuously moving process. If you look at the moderate evidence items, there are some complexity. For example, uh, preoperative optimization. There are high level of evidence for stopping smoking four weeks before surgery but there are low evidence for uh, alcohol stopping before surgery. When it comes to epidurals, there are high level evidence for open surgery, but low evidence for, for laparoscopic surgery. And if you look at laparoscopic surgery, there are high level evidence for oncological outcome, but low evidence for morbidity, and so on. I mean, all the, and to add, if you look at, for example, prevention of ileus, uh, laparoscopic surgery is a high level, uh, there are high, high, high level evidence for, for uh, prevention of ILUS, uh, but low evidence, for example, for magnesium oxide. So the, the items trying to hook in each other and affect each other. Now, you should put some special attention at the lowest row, uh, because we are soon coming back to them. The question is, is there an automatic correlation between a high level evidence item and high impact when used, when used within the full ERAS program? And I think one way of finding out that is to record and analyze compliance. And when you analyze compliance, you have to be aware of confounding because preoperative items are affecting outcome directly, but also will affect the use of intraoperative items and postoperative items that in turn affects outcome. So I think that uh, if, you, if you want to keep up from confounding, you can only use the preoperative or some intraoperative items, I mean to have really valid data without confound, risk of confounding. So this we made a study at Erster Hospital in 2011 about compliance. And then we compared two groups, one early group and, uh, and one late group uh, of patients. And we kind of knew on forehand that, that compliance was improving during the years. 
So, uh, which was confirmed by the results uh, that in the later group the, the compliance was 70% and in the early group 40%. And you can say that overall outcome was improved in the late period. But I think the most interesting with this study was that we, we measured compliance on all patients in both periods together. For example, if a patient fulfilled seven or out of 12 items, we calculated a 58% 50, uh, compliance. And what, I mean, you've seen this uh, diagram a few times now, but, but what is so fascinating is that it's a, it's a dose response relationship between uh, symptoms, delaying the charge, morbidity, and uh, adherence to the protocol. For example, if you have a compliance le less than 50%, you have a risk of, of a complication in a rate of 50%. If you have more than 90% compliance, the risk of a complication after surgery is 25%. The same comes to, to uh, length of stay. The, the better compliance you have, the fewer uh, days after surgery at hospital. Now, we did try to find some independent uh, predictors for outcome. And we saw that nearly all of the pre- and perioperative ERAS items influence the different outcomes in a beneficial way. But especially we saw uh, two independent predict uh, pre predictors of outcome. And one is if you gave the patient one liter extra of uh, uh, intravenous fluids from mean, you increase the risk of postoperative morbidity by 32% and you increase the risk of uh, postoperative symptoms delaying discharge by 16%. If you use the preoperative carbohydrate drink, you decrease the risk of postoperative symptoms with 44%, and you lower the risk of overloading patients with fluids. Now, if we go back to the uh, evidence table again, I think it's quite interesting that the independent predictors in our study correlates to the items that have, have low evidence, uh, level of evidence in these tables, uh, which underlines that, uh, that it is really difficult to analyze the effect of, of different items. Next example, the LAFA study, comparing uh, laparoscopic and OPIC open surgery with and without the ERAS protocol. And here they had 73% 70, compliance in the ERAS group, 11 out of 15 items, and surprisingly 40% in the non-ERAS group, 6 of 15 items. Now you start to wonder, were they really comparing uh, the ERAS protocol and traditional, the, the tra uh, traditional perioperative care? I think no. Overall compliance was 60%, and they looked for independent uh, predictors of outcome. One was laparoscopic surgery, female sex, early oral food, and early mobilization. Now, female sex is not an ERAS item, and early oral food and early mobilization are likely to be confounded by the preoperative items. Anyway, I think it's interesting to look at the, the um, evidence slide again. Because again, the independent predictors correlates to a low level item, uh, which again underlines that it's, it is very difficult to, to analyze which are the most important items. Uh, and um, it's so hard to sum up the effect because the effects are going in different directions. And maybe it's a uh, the importance of the individual items is likely to be influenced by the variation in compliance and the interaction between items in any given study situation, which makes it even more far, uh, hard to, to draw firm conclusions. I put a lot of hope to the new ERAS database, and we saw some examples of that today, uh, the new compliance study. Uh, this will be a fantastic source of, of new research in the future, I think. Thank you.